And here we are. Welcome to the Reality OS. I'm Peter Duke, and Tracy Connors and I are joined today by Michael Carlin. How you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. How you doing, Tracy? I'm excellent. So, what brings us here today, Tracy? Well, you had said you had a nice dinner. I believe it was with Michael and George. Right? Three times. Three times. Oh, yeah. three nice dinners with three Michael nights and... in a row. Yeah. Wow. And that um, Michael had this whole line on Tupac Shakur's murder, Compton PD being corrupt, basically the whole city of of Compton being corrupt. And I've always been interested in that because I was a senior in high school when Tupac got shot. It's not just Compton. I know. I get it. I get it. It's 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 bigger than Compton. Compton. Right. Yeah. But um, I, I've always been interested in the fact that that, that murder is unsolved. So I wanted to hear. Michael's made a documentary about it, right, called The Battle for Compton. And, and written two books. There yeah. you go. So this is the man. And he can relate it to all the stuff that we talk about all the time anyway. So it's kind and, of a and, cool and not un, And not unlike George uh, Webb, lost a partner along the way yeah. too, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. And we can talk about that too. You know, it's still painful. I'm sure it's painful for George too to talk about. So where do where do you want to start, Tracy? Well, I think we should start at how Michael got. How did you get onto this thread to begin with? You don't so strike I'm, me as a Compton rap <laughs> fiend, you know. No, I mean I never set out to do this, and you know a lot of us that get involved in this stuff don't set out to do this. But I had worked with a couple. And there was a Laotian man who had worked for the CIA, and he was being extradited back to Laos, which was going to be a death sentence for him. And uh, I got involved with this couple, and we were very successful in getting him, you know, the extradition stopped for a time while we were working on it. We were calling the State Department every day, and there were a bunch of us that were behind this, and we were writing articles and sending out stuff. The gentleman's name was Mua Tuatere. And uh, so anyway, after we kind of finished up that project, the couple said to me, hey, you got to meet our nephew. And I was like, who's your nephew? They said, Russell Poole. So I started talking to Russell Poole on the phone. We had many great conversations. And then one day we met. And he started talking to me about the confession letter to the murder of Tupac. And, and for the audience, who was who is Russell Poole? So Russell Poole is the whistleblower that gave us the Rampart scandal. He was the lead detective on the Biggie Smalls murder. He was the lead detective on the Kevin Gaines murder. He was the lead detective on en- Ennis Cosby's murder. And he started to see that there were numerous cases that started leading towards each other. And there were clues that were in common. And he started to see that there was a big scandal inside of Rampart, a lot of corruption. And he kept being told by Bernard Parks to stand down. And Russell had never been told before in his LAPD career to stand down and not investigate something when the clues led him towards corrupt people. And it just became this big battle between Bernard Parks and Russell Poole and Russell Poole ended up leaving the department over it. He was 19 and a half years with the LAPD. In six months, he would have he would have vested in his pension fund, but he just could no longer stay in a corrupt department. And so he chose to do the right thing over collecting the paycheck and the pension. And so he left the department. And then this one case, the Tupac and Biggie murders, which is really one case instead of two, always didn't sit well with him and he decided to continue to pursue it and he connected with me and we decided that we were going to work together and and then how did that end well how it ended was i set up a meeting with sheriff jimmy mcdonald i had worked on jimmy mcdonald's campaign to become sheriff and helped him become sheriff And I cornered Jimmy at a Leadership LA event, which was alumni only. And, you know, the LA Chamber of Commerce does these events. And when I cornered Jimmy, Jimmy had stopped responding to Russell and I, our text messages and our emails. 
because he really didn't want to be involved. And Jimmy never disclosed to me that he was involved in the FBI's investigation of these murders. So he knew a lot more than he ever let on to us. I wouldn't find that out until actually about six months ago. I found that out. Wow. But anyway, Jimmy McDonald um, reluctantly agreed to a meeting that uh, Russell and I were going to be able to present evidence to reopen the cases because we had new evidence. And then we learned something about three weeks before the meeting. And we learned that Russell Poole, uh, well, Russell and I both learned that Suge Knight, uh, in his case, there were shooters at the nightclub at the One Oak that were let in by an off-duty sheriff and that those same shooters were driven to the airport the next day. And so the sheriffs had some culpability in the attempted murder on Shug Knight. And there was a conflict of interest because the investigator at One Oak was the same investigator as the investigator at Tams, which is also known as Murder Burger. And you may have seen George and I drive through Murder Burger, you know, a few days ago. Mm -hmm. So when Russell went it's, to it's this a little meeting, bit it's a little bit more than a conflict of interest though yeah no I mean, it's that, a massive that... conflict of interest <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and so you know when there was a, a lead investigator that called and said hey russell what do you want to talk about and he said well i want to talk about this you know conflict of interest and i want to talk about this off-duty sheriff that let the shooters into the club 27 cameras at the one oak so it's not like it's, you know, easy to suppress that. And he said, you know, I found out about this. And I found out that he also drove him to the airport the next day. And there's cameras at LAX showing the shooters getting out of this off-duty sheriff's car. And the sheriff said, this is now a cop thing. You can't bring Carlin to the meeting. Come alone. And Russell but, went to but, that meeting. But at this point, Russell wasn't a cop, though, right? No, no, no. He's he's retired. Right. And, you know, but because he was a an investigator and well respected by Jimmy McDonald, Jimmy McDonald and Russell had worked together at, uh, you know, LAPD. So they knew each other. Well, I just reintroduced them to each other. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I said to Russell, hey, you don't really have to go to this if you don't want to. No, no, no. I want to make sure that, you know, I don't want to disappoint Jimmy over this. I'm going to go to the meeting and Russell went to that meeting and he died in the meeting with the sheriffs at sheriff's headquarters. Uh, what's the cause of death allegedly? So here's the interesting part. The family was told he never got into the meeting. He died in the waiting room. Jimmy McDonald himself told me, he said at the conclusion of the meeting, Russell grabbed his chest and passed away and had a massive heart attack. And when the L.A. County coroner's uh, autopsy came, they said it was a brain aneurysm, not a heart attack. So none of this makes any sense. I mean, it does make sense. They don't want these cases investigated. And when you think about it, you know, if Tupac, which there were LAPD cops in Las Vegas at the time, Tupac was murdered. If Tupac's lifetime earnings had to be paid by the city of Los Angeles, and by the way, those cops were on duty at the time, then the city of Los Angeles would have to pay out a billion dollars in Tupac's potential lifetime earnings, plus potentially triple damages. And then if you look at Biggie, it's the same thing. So you're looking at an $8 billion problem. And that's why they just don't want these cases open. And how many other cases would this lead to? How many other settlements? How many other payouts? Well, Rampart was a $125 million payout, and they capped it off. I, I don't know. I, I, money, money is one way of looking at it. But what you're talking about is like Rico on a, on a, on a radical scale, <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a Washington, D.C. scale, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, no. These yeah. are big numbers. It, yeah, but it's but I yeah, but I don't even think it's about money. I think it's about the number of people that are going to wind up going to jail uh, or yeah, having the, that too. Yeah, you yeah. know, just that too, and it leads to drug trafficking. It leads to money laundering. It leads to murder for hire. It leads to all kinds of bad things. 
for LAPD, and it was already the most expensive and worst scandal in police history in the United States. Really? Yep. So you do a you do a a, a really good job uh, in the book and in the films the because you've made a few films about it. You've made a movie and then you've done some YouTube videos that I've watched and yeah. You you really kind of you know do the George Webb style kind of uh, uh, deep dive on this. You know uh, you you talk about all of the details and all of this stuff, um, and uh, it's it's amazing how many names and relationships there are because it it's it's. Uh, like the George Webb kind of stuff, it gets difficult after a while to kind of like juggle all of the things. So uh, just on a meta level, uh, you know, top down kind of looking at the, the, the police involvement and uh, the death row records uh, involvement. Uh, We, when we talked earlier, uh, we were talking about how, uh, you know, this story seems to kind of dovetail with American made with the Barry seal story. Um, so what do you think was actually happening uh, uh, that, that created all of these events? Well, it's interesting that you mention American Maid. Uh, the head of detectives at LAPD that Russell worked for was a man named Sergio Robledo. And Sergio Robledo is another man who's no longer with us. And Russell had set up a meeting for me to go meet with Sergio because he was the former lead investigator in the Wallace civil trial. And by Wallace, I mean Christopher Wallace, Biggie Smalls' mother, had filed suit against the city of Los Angeles, and Sergio was the lead investigator. And, you know, I was supposed to meet with him for like 45 minutes. I get down there, and like 6 o'clock at night, you know, for a 10 o'clock in the morning meeting, I'm still there. And the very last thing he says to me is he says, if you continue to investigate this, you are going to find that... The CIA put drugs out on the streets of America. And I just, I couldn't possibly believe that at the time. What year, sure what, enough, what, year, what year was this? So that would have been 2014. Okay. And in 2014, I just shook my head because I really didn't know who Gary Webb was at the time. And, you know, and I, I started doing my research, but I did actually find the smoking gun document that links all of this to the CIA putting drugs out on the streets of America. And so what I believe was happening at the time was that death row records was a money laundering operation. I don't believe Tupac sold 250 million albums while he was alive. And, you know, Peter in kind of our pre, you know, warm up or whatever, we talked a little bit about this. You know, the artists weren't being paid what they thought they should be paid because maybe they weren't actually earning the income because they would see the but, numbers and think, oh, I just sold 250 million albums, so I need to get paid X. And that money never hit Death Row Records because that money was being cause, yeah, cause those 200 Because they never sold 250 million CDs. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, while Tupac was alive, I don't believe he sold 250 million copies. I don't believe any of the artists were selling what they, you know, were reporting on ShowScan. And, you know, so that money was somehow being repatriated. I think I know the mechanism. I had met a gentleman by the name of Gene Giaquinto, and I, you know, did a deep dive on him. And he was involved at Universal Home Video. And what they were doing is paying duplicators that didn't exist. And they had retailers that didn't exist, that they were bringing in the money from the retailers to legitimize the drug money. So this is how the money laundering operation worked. And it's the same for the music. And in fact, music is more of an end end solution than movies are. Because you got theaters and you got other things in movies that make it a little bit more difficult to launder money with movies. It's I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying music is like an end-to-end solution and that's probably why you have many artists that have died and guess what there's nobody from their family that actually handles their estates i mean isn't that interesting yeah maybe they yeah maybe they figure maybe they figure they do too much bookkeeping yeah the bookkeeping is real simple i mean you know we 
we have money that we have over here in this pocket that needs to get into another pocket and the great way to do it is through music and right. you know i've i've always heard that music was the dirtiest business in the country and i believe it is so when you say you found the smoking gun document that links that shows that the cia was putting drugs on the streets what what was contained in that document and how did you get a hold of it Okay, so what's in that document is that document is a disciplinary uh, document for an attorney who was working as a deputy district attorney at the same time he was renting Suge Knight's house and he was investigating Suge Knight, okay? And his daughter got a music contract. And, and so this document actually, believe it or not, talks about the operation that he was the head of this guy was not just the deputy district attorney investigating death row records. He was also in charge of a task force called Operation New Wave. And Operation New Wave was cocaine being put out on the streets of America by the CIA. And so this document links all of this together. I've never released that document, but you know what? I think it's time to release that document. And, and, and what, year, what year was that? So this is, uh, I want to say 90, I think this popped out in 1996, late 96, but the discipline I don't think happened until 97. And he got reprimanded, not a big deal. He got fired from the DA's office. But I think it's time to get this document out. So I'll commit to you guys that we'll release that document. Great. So this guy is investigating Suge Knight, but living in a house that he owns at the same time? Yeah. I mean, that's also a huge conflict of interest. And <laughs> yeah. Peter probably knows L.A. is just rife with conflict of interest, you know. And until I got involved in this, there were, uh, you know, every single person that was involved in the death row record stuff was saying no cops ever worked for death row records. And that was the official party line. And then as I started to dig in, I found documents. And then I went and talked to Beverly Hills police, old salty dog police officers. And they were telling me about, you know, we hated it when Rafael Perez and David Mack and Kevin Gaines would show up here and they would flash their badges and they would tell us that, you know, we couldn't touch them. And we knew they were bringing their drugs and their, you know, crime into our city and we hated it. And there wasn't a lot we could do because politically, you know, there was some kind of deal worked out, but they were always told to stand down. It's, I mean, like, the, literally, it's like the scene in American Made where Tom Cruise offers to buy all the cops Cadillacs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He should and, have taken you know, the caddies, boys. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I, I forget the uh, drug dealer's name, but he was down. He was caught in Costa Rica. And the people who caught him, he said, look, I'll cut a deal right now. I will pay off Mexico's entire debt, their national debt, if you let me go. And that tells you the kind of money that's involved in this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, sidebar, somebody tweeted out this morning that, my, you know, Michael Bloomberg, when he ran for president, he, he, um, he spent uh, $500 million running for yeah. president. And somebody tweeted out that uh, he could he could have written a check for a million dollars to every American and saved himself one hundred and fifty million dollars uh, in the, in that campaign. Be yeah. And and, uh, and then, you know, when it was happening at the time, you know, I immediately thought, well, Michael Bloomberg isn't really running for president. What he's doing is he's financing all these TV stations for the for the election run. So he's, you know, he's because what? Who gets the money when when somebody runs for president? The TV stations who are running yeah. the commercials get the money. And just under COVID, his wealth has gone up by ten billion dollars. I mean, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Yep. So there's a lot of shenanigans that go on with money, and uh, and I, I've to totally hijacked the conversation now. Mm -hmm. So, no, I mean, it's, it's so I'll fine. stop now. It's fine, though. It's fine. Um, so, so you met these policemen, and these policemen had a story to tell, and uh, and did something happen to the second policeman that you're talking about? 
which which second or was uh, it Rafael Sergio yeah. yeah Sergio Robledo you know he had a heart attack he was young and in pretty good shape and you know I mean you know supposedly Russell had a heart attack supposedly Sergio what, had a heart what kind attack. of shape what kind of shape was Russ in Russ was walking five miles a day he was living out in Palm Desert and uh, you know he he had a spring in his step he had a new woman that he was seeing you know he was excited about going to this meeting and you know i just couldn't believe it was like a non sequitur all of a sudden you know russell's dead and i found out about it through a tupac fan out of england he he texted me and said hey man is it true russell's dead and i was waiting to hear from russell about the meeting and you know i that sent me into a tailspin i mean it was you know Right. So, so, but, and then you released the book immediately because you, that you hadn't even finished writing because you That's just, correct. you just wanted to push it out, right? I called Sergio Robledo once I found out and said, Hey, man, I don't know what to do. He said, Take the manuscript, whatever you've got, release it as quick as you can. So I pulled an all nighter to clean it up the best I could. And I sent it out to like three or 4,000 hip hop magazines and people that I knew were in hip hop and just got it released. And then I did a press release uh, to make sure that people knew that it was out and if they wanted copies, they could contact me. And I had a lot of people contact me and released it for free. I mean, you know, it wasn't about making money at that point. It was about just getting the information out. And that's, I think that was a smart move actually in retrospect. Yeah, it could have saved your life. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. I think I'm I'm happy that, uh, you know, but of course, as things kind of heated up here, the place that I would go and be safe was would be China, believe it or not. So I ended up going to China and spending time over there. And I wrote a book for the Chinese market as well, which is about the same stuff. It's called An American Murder, but it was released in China and did real well over there. Interesting. Um, so that was just a way for you to kind of like lay low and uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and keep it going. Um, yeah. And so what has the reaction been? I mean, uh, you, you talked about uh, Tom, Tom McDonald. Is that his name? Uh, uh, Jimmy McDonald. J- Jimmy McDonald. Uh, yeah. yeah, I remember when he was running, I asked him if he was going to start if he was going to start issuing concealed carry permits. And he 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 gave me a, a three minute non answer. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. At, at which point I, I lost kind of interest in him. But um uh, so well, there was a big there was a big scandal under Baca with the celebrities that all had you know guns and badges and it was you know celebrities were able to carry mm-hmm. and you know Baca had his own troubles and Baca was actually a really good friend of mine you know he went off to prison and my understanding is he's been released so and he was you know he, he was actually indicted and went to prison because of the corrupt. Compton Police Department, believe it or not, it all flowed through that corrupt Compton Police Department. Right. You want to talk about that a little bit because Compton was corrupt, and then they kind of got absorbed into the LA Sheriff's Department, but then they I mean, didn't. They didn't yeah. really change any personnel. They just changed their uniforms. Is that there was a uh, there was corruption down in Compton, and the former mayor gets a knock on the door one day, and it's the feds because there's been a an officer in Long Beach that's been shot with a gun that flowed through death row records and then it flowed to the uh, Compton Police Department was supposed to be in the evidence locker and the ballistics matched and it was used to shoot officer Brian Watt now Brian Watt didn't pass away but he was definitely he was shot in the head and he has and he had uh, all kinds of problems you know, medically, but he, he finally was able to go back to the police department. But anyway, this this gun was a big problem and the feds knocked on the former mayor at the time he was the mayor's door and said, hey, you're either stupid or you're in on it. And he said, I'm stupid. And <laughs> he went down to the Compton uh, PD and he relieved the man that was in charge. His name was Hori Taylor. And uh, and they did an investigation and there's a 96 page report which i was able to get a copy of and it details that there when they started to do the investigation 
there was 96 kilos of cocaine that went missing out of the evidence locker. And there had been a helicopter crash and there were kilos of cocaine that were strewn about the debris field. And you, you ask it, yourself, it was, it was a police department helicopter crash. It was a, it was a Calif a, a Compton PD helicopter that crashed. And so there's kilos of cocaine strewn about the debris field. And you ask yourself, why does a city the size of Compton need six police helicopters that were all given to them by the U S military? as surplus and those were the helicopters that were being used to move the cocaine ask and, Barry you know, Seal. Think about it. yeah oh, exactly oh you can't <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah and there's a lot of people that you can't ask anymore because they're no longer with us I mean you know it's just crazy well the gun it's, the gun didn't didn't the gun that was used to shoot Tupac have a similar provenance didn't it wasn't it an evident evidence locker gun yes and that that flowed through the santa monica police department that was a uh, fatal's glock and fatal had tried to get it into a nightclub and santa monica pd was working off duty found it on him was gonna arrest him you know the head of security for death row records is a former cop he was no 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 don't arrest him just you know go ahead and take it they ran ballistics on that gun, and the ballistics matched Tupac. But you'll never really hear that from, you yeah, know, Yeah, when from did police. that happen? So that happened before the murder. And then, you know, the former head of security for death row had one of the security people working for him keep tabs on a gun, and they went and got the gun back. And then that gun was given to the shooters at a gang, what it was called a gang truce meeting, and uh, Balboa Park, and that's the gun that was used. To shoot Tupac. Which is where, which is where Robert Seffer makes his intros for his videos. <laughs> I, yeah, there you go. I, I, ironically, but yeah. but I guess my question, Michael, is when did they do the ballistics analysis to prove that that was the actual murder? Well, weapon? that was done before. Believe it or not, that was done before. And when those ballistics did match, then all that got swept under the carpet by Las Vegas PD. And there was actually one of the police helicopters in Compton was given to the Las Vegas PD. And, you know, I was told that it was a payoff uh, to keep the Tupac murder quiet. Well, I guess so, my question is, I, I suffered through that A&E documentary that they did, yeah. the six parter. That's yeah. I was episode five. I, I know yeah. I saw you, but I was yeah. like, I hope Michael shows up in this because otherwise this is a Benjamin Crump attorney at law commercial. Yeah, well, that's what it was. Spread was out it, over six. Was episodes. it Benjamin Crump? Benjamin Crump yeah. hosts it, Peter. Yeah, and Holy. one of the people, one like the talking me. heads, are Michael Eric Dyson and Kevin Powell, and all the you know, it, it's all framed the way that you would expect it to be, given those characters are involved. Well, Be Benjamin Crump is all fiction all the time. Like, yes, oh I yeah, know. yeah, no doubt. I, yeah. I know. Uh, and he, we agree on that. Yeah. yeah, And, uh, you know, if you look at episode five, it's like the only episode that actually makes sense. And then Benjamin Crump's like, oh, no, that's not right. That can't possibly be. And they move on to episode six. Right. Where they find some gun that was tossed over a fence. And that's the murder yeah. weapon. We know who did it now. It's this guy that has always been pinned on. Yeah. And it, it totally gets away. And you would think Benjamin Crump would, for his own reputation, would care about going after corrupt cops. He's one yeah. of the people that could do that and not get murdered, potentially. No, no, he he only goes after good cops. I, yeah. I get that, Peter, Let's, but I'm yeah. saying if you actually wanted to be the hero that he thinks he is and portrays himself as, and he's apparently convinced a whole bunch of people, including Tupac's poor brother who's in the whole the whole thing getting dragged along, like Ben and his, his team are going to get to the bottom of this. It doesn't this sound like a George Webb school play? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. hey, and by the way, I, I, I have to give a shout out to George because as I was investigating this, you know, at a certain point, I became aware of George Webb. He started talking about school plays. I started seeing, you know what, that's what this is. It's a school play. And so I give props to him because I would never have gotten to where I got with this investigation if it hadn't been for George. And it's a school play. You've mm -hmm. got uh, Benjamin Crump, who plays the Al Sharpton, the Jesse Jackson character. He's the new version of it. 
and comes into all these cases he, and he, himself. I, I, I would argue that he is 10 times more effective than Al Sharpton or Jesse right. Jackson ever were. Like, yeah. he, you know, Ferguson well, and Trayvon Martin and Black Lives Matter and all that stuff would not have happened without Benjamin Crump in the background just pulling all of the strings. Sure. But well, he's like the next generation. He's taking the torch. Yeah. And actually, the very last episode, the final scene is him sitting, I think, in a church with the Reverend Al. And Al Sharpton hadn't been in the entire six hours of the thing. And he's like, why the hell is he here? Oh, it's just to kind of symbolically say Crump is the new guy. Yeah. Oh, so he's anointing him. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. It, it's really They're passing gross. the baton. Yeah. And you know what? They perfect these things. You know, they start out doing it and, you know, and as they get an experience modification, they learn how to do it better and better and better. And it just, you know, look, Benjamin Crump's much better. Mm hmm. He is. And right. he's got a law degree, which is more yeah. dangerous. But I mean, this is the story. If you can get your story out, this could actually unseat that fool. Potentially. Well, and show I don't think anything's going to. Gonna, yeah, really? Gonna you investigated him. Tupac? And, and you came up with this BS when there's here's this and that and we could take down a whole bunch of corrupt cops. And, you know, they they have clips of Tupac because if people aren't familiar with his uh, family, they were Black Panthers. So yeah. there's a clip in that A&E thing where he's going off about, you know, corrupt CIA, corrupt cops, corrupt FBI, like this whole system is rigged. And there, there's little side mentions. Like if, if Tupac had said, I want 100 white people, 100 black people, 100 Latinos to show up at City Hall and we're taking out the government, they would have done it the next day. So that was one of the motivations that they looked at and said he could actually lead a revolution against these guys. Well, and that all goes back to J. Edgar Hoover. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had the Black Panthers show up at the California Assembly, 150 people, all with their guns, you know, they brought them in legally. There weren't actual bullets in the guns. But, you know, that's kind of intimidating. And then you had shootings in South Central where the Black Panthers would show up 150 deep with their guns, asking the police at the scene of the crime how this happened and confronting the police. And that was very intimidating. And you had J. Edgar Hoover say, you know, if there's going to be black militants, they're going to be dead black militants. And he declared war on the Black Panther Party. And, you know, this is all fairly well documented. Sure. And, and, Shakur, and, Tupac, and Shakur, yeah, Shakur's mother is in is, is still in Cuba, right? No, it's, it's his aunt. No, that's it's his aunt. aunt yeah. That's his aunt. That's his aunt, yeah. No, his, his mother still, passed yeah. away, sadly. Yeah. And yeah. she's another one, drinks a bottle of water, has a heart attack and passes away. I mean, you know, and the estate's worth, you know, whatever, probably hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, they've, they've monetized the estate a lot more now since she passed than before she passed. Sure. So, you know, she was, a, a, she's a very interesting person because mm -hmm. she was a Black Panther. She was on trial for murder. She defended herself successfully against a murder beef while she was pregnant with Tupac. Yes. And... The fear of J. Edgar Hoover was that there would be a black messiah that would arise. And so anytime there was somebody that started to have a voice, they would immediately set about to either do a character assassination or an outright assassination. And it's really a sad commentary that our government would employ these kind of methods to go after anybody to, you know, well, destroy it, them. Well, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, the conclusion that I've come to is that it's not our government, it's the mob. And the mob uses the government like a skin suit in order to, uh, you know, give themselves a patina of legitimacy. That if you, if you look at how the FBI has been behaving, uh, you know, openly in the last five years, the way that the Justice Department has been acting openly in the last five years, and then you trickle down that behavior to all of the localities around the country. And you basically, the, the country is run by the mob. And they have these things called elections in order to make everybody believe that there is uh, some kind of government, as my friend Greg calls it, uh, that, is, that is running things. But 
Um, if you look at you know the zoning laws that are just being trampled all over the United States right now, and the fact that uh, 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 private home ownership is just disappearing right in front of us, the Great Reset kind of stuff is happening. It's like the, these are not unrelated. You know, the 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 drugs and the money laundering and the and the manipulations of stock markets and th things like that. They're not, they're not unrelated, and. And so I think that we fool ourselves when we when we look at this and call it a government. If if you've got guys in the LAPD who know that other guys in the LAPD are criminals and are racketeering inside the LAPD and they they have figured out that there's nothing that they can do about it. Like that should be the story of the century. You know, but here you are on the reality OS with 31 people watching uh, live. More people will watch this later. <laughs> but, you know, this this should be a monstrous, huge story. But uh, it doesn't get on the front of the Los Angeles Times. It doesn't get on the fr in front of the New York Times. And uh, people don't know that it's happening. So I'll get off and my And we basically box. have, no, we have media that's being controlled by a few companies they're mega companies. They all talk to each other. You know, that used to be called collusion, restraint of trade. There used to be monopoly, you know, powers to come in and shut them down. And we don't have that now. We don't no. have that at all. And I'm with you about the mafia because there was a marriage between the mafia and the CIA. And it was probably just before the Kennedy assassination, probably Bay of Pigs. Might have been before that. Might have been drug trafficking out of Southeast Asia or drug trafficking, you know, all the way back to World War II. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just we don't know the extent. But and, and it's not the entire government. It's factions of the government. And, you know, one of the one of the things that I just got out of this Maryland trip was we, we went and did a memorial for McDuff and we did the William Colby tour. And those were two dudes that were standing up trying to fight the Bloods and the Crips being started. They were trying to fight the CIA corruption. And, you know, both of them met what, what I consider to be untimely deaths. You know, there was a, there was a person down in Compton who one of the content PDs had come up behind his head and hit him with some kind of a pinprick and a big tumor grew. And, you know, he had to have cancer surgery because of that. And so, you know, McDuff's father had some kind of a fast growing cancer. And we don't know that wasn't somehow, you know, given to him as opposed to him just contracting it, you know, naturally. Right. Well, look at Russ, look at uh, uh, Andrew Breitbart, look at, uh, yeah. you know, all these other people who just dropped dead of a heart attack. I mean, uh, wasn't it the uh, church commission where uh, Colby yeah, said the heart attack gun. That, that we have yeah. a heart attack gun? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we've um, never used it. Never once have we used it. I mean, it's just it's insane to think that they have a tool like that that they've never once used. Right. Well, I'm um, jumping back to something that you said earlier. Then, when you're talking about the mafia, like I, I, I even think that the scope is bigger than that. I, one of my takeaways from reading the book Operation Gladio is to, is the understanding that the mafia and uh, certain uh, Masonic orders and the Va certain parts of the Vatican and the certain parts of the Central Intelligence Agency and obviously certain parts of the Los Angeles Police Department and Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, they're all kind of the hands and feet of the same kind of octopus. And and so, you know, but I've, I've said before that I think that the Godfather movies and the uh, Martin Scorsese movies and the Sopranos are all kind of limited hangouts because they leave out the Masons, the Vatican's and the CIA. Um, and they're, they're all kind of working together. They're all different kinds of divisions of the same beast. Um, and so if we limit ourselves to like, you know, Italian and Jewish mobsters, you know, we're, we're leaving part of the, uh, the, the equation out there. Well, I think when you look at it, you have groups out there, whatever you want to call them, and they are all competing over revenue streams. And, you know, they're trying to proliferate. They're trying to have pockets of money that they can, you know, have to use for their covert operations. And when a Bolin Amendment comes along, 
or if we're going to ban gain of function research, then, you know, we got to have a pocket of money that we can draw from that we can circumvent Congress. So, you know, it, this has well, been going on for well, years. What, what, what does Congress do except cover for them now? Well, to That's your point from earlier, Peter, if there are cops in, in any jurisdiction, it doesn't matter. I know we're talking about Los Angeles Compton now, but I know, you know, I'm from more familiar with Philadelphia cops. One of them was a professor of mine that talked about how corrupt it was. And if there are cops that aren't corrupt, that aren't blowing the whistle on the corrupt cops, they're just as liable, in my opinion. And the same goes for Congress. They know that all this stuff is going on, and if they don't, then they need to be the hell out of there because it doesn't take genius to pay attention a little bit. But they aren't doing anything to rein this stuff in. Well, you know what? You bring up a good point. One of my uh, former films is about an American who served as a Mexican federale, and it was really the first time I was ever exposed to corruption. But I remember going with him to border Mexico and as I'm coming back, I'm like, you know what? It's a good thing that all of this corruption stops right here <laughs> because we don't have it on our side. And he just laughed at me. Right. He says, oh, you're so naive. He said, who do you think we deliver the drugs to? I was like, what? We have corruption in America? He's like, we deliver it to the sheriffs and the police. He said, we don't deliver it to normal people over here. And half the time he was facilitating drugs getting into America, and the other half the time he was taking down drug dealers that had fallen out of favor with the Mexican government. And, you know, he just thought I was so naive, and I was back then, completely. So, you know, it's it's been going on for a long time. That interview, I did the key interview in 2000. And I waited until 2013 to release the film because we just had to wait for people to pass away. It was too dangerous. Sure. And sadly, Lobo, who is in the film, is no longer with us, too. You know, they eventually got him. As we were completing the edit on the film, he was shot outside his house. And then, you know, they ended up getting him a few years later. He lived through the, you know, the shooting. I don't know so, why anybody would do that job. Yeah, well, he was making a lot of money. I mean, he would get his uh, his state checks when he was with the state police, and they'd stack up because he was making, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month. And then when he became a federale, after he got fired, by the way, from the state police for arresting one of the, you know, political leader's son, you know, so he gets fired, and he gets promoted to become a federale and starts making hundreds of thousands a month. I mean, you know. Wow. And, he's, and that's he, legit? Like that's their government paychecks are hundreds of thousands a month? No, no. It was oh. like a vending route. You know, okay. he'd go collect his vending route. <laughs> oh, I got this prostitution ring over here. I got this money laundering thing over here. I got these drug dealers over there. So he's These the, people he's are printing the titles to, yeah, they're printing <laughs> titles to stolen cars. You know, he told me about all that stuff. And all that stuff's going on over in Mexico. And, you know. I just, oh, it couldn't possibly be happening in America. Wow. But then you find out it is. And it doesn't matter where you start the investigation. So, so are, are, are the Mexican drug cartels like the beta test for what they're going to roll out in, in the United States? Is that what's, what we're really dealing with? I think so. I mean, I think what we're looking at is the, you know, the splintering of the cartels is what created the hyperviolence. And the first thing that they did was they did the guns for uh, food program where they were able to confiscate guns from the Mexican people. And that's what led to the hyperviolence. I mean, the minute you disarm a, you know, a, a society, you are leading them to the point where you can actually take them over because now the military has guns, the police have guns and the, the bad guys all have guns and the public is defenseless. Yeah, look at New Zealand and Australia now. Yeah. They're... Yeah. But it's, and Mexico looking, was the same. Why don't they just legalize drugs in Mexico? Well, Would that make this violence go it. away? I, I think it's always the same answer. It's it's because the yeah. people who are making so much money right, right. now don't want anyone else exactly. to make that much money. Exactly, but you would think if we're told all this crime is happening because of the illegality of drugs and you have these competing gangs, it's like if we made it legal, what happens? I got an answer for you, and it's and it goes right back to Compton. There is a lawsuit that's happening right now, and it's a uh, it's a one of the marijuana dispensaries down in Compton. 
Okay, they mm -hmm. call it the Aja Brown tax. It's a nine percent tax that they have to pay, but they don't pay it to the city of Compton directly. Okay, the, the there these authorities have been showing up with fake warrants signed by a superior court judge, but it's all copy paste. It's not real. And they raid the marijuana shop. And one of the raids was documented. It was $60,000 in, uh, in, in cash and a hundred and some thousand dollars in weed. They confiscate the weed and the cash. It never shows up at the city of Compton. And then uh, you know, and they've got literally hundreds of weed stores and they're, they were, they came into Compton on a loophole. So they're not permitted. They're not legal, but they're making so much more money off of illegal weed shops that they just let it proliferate. And why would you ever want to legalize it when the city officials are, you know, the city, so, I think it's so, the, so that's the Mexican federale model. I mean, it is. It yeah. is. You're going you, around, you, you're collecting money. Right. It's a vending machine, and you're going there and collecting. I mean, there's there have been 100 raids, and if you look at the model, okay, 100 raids times $260,000, that's a an awful lot of money over the course of a few years. And where's that money go? It goes to, you know, it goes to these officials and some people that are probably not officials. And then what do you do with the weed and the money? You cut up the money and you sell the weed someplace else. Mm -hmm. And there's people that are caught up in this investigation right now. And we'll see what happens. But you know what I think is going to happen? I think nothing. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be some slaps on the wrist and, you know, somebody gets paid off and the uh, whole investigation just goes away. So the, the, the civil suit right now is um, and and you know what the uh, the weed shop that's that filed the civil suit is called the Chronic. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like Death Row Records? That was a Snoop album, and no, yeah, a Dre that, album. That was a that was a Dre and Snoop was on that album yeah. too. That but, was his premiere you know, or debut, right? It was called Compton Chronic. Was the okay. uh, is the name of the weed store, and <laughs> uh, and Shug's uh, former attorney's brother is the guy that owned the weed store. So, I mean, you know, this it stuff just keeps back. recycling. And it's all can, in the family. See. It's all in the family. Yeah. Now, to jump back to the Tupac stuff, I don't know that I ever got clear. What What do you think was the motivation, the motive to kill him? Were they trying to kill Suge and Tupac? And who yes. done it? Okay. okay. So, so here's really what happened. You had a uh, a ring of cops, and the ring of cops, one of them was known for actually went to prison for stealing evidence out of the evidence locker and he was stealing cocaine well previous to that snoop's murder trial the evidence for snoop's murder trial was in lapd pacific division and they didn't have a lot of security on that uh, evidence locker and these cops ran an operation a school play if you will to go steal that evidence out of the evidence locker. And so when it came time for the evidence to be presented, LAPD was hemming and hawing, and they, you know, at the trial, and they were embarrassed because they couldn't find the evidence, and, you know, and Snoop gets acquitted. Well, what happens when you bring a ring of thieves into the record label? Well, they start looking around and saying, you know what, we could steal this stuff. We could steal this record label. So they enlist Suge Knight's estranged wife, and her boyfriend is one of the corrupt LAPD cops, and they decide that they're going to take down the record label. And the perfect time to do it is when Tupac and Suge are in the car together. They're going to kill him. And so that's what they decide they're going to do. They hired gangbangers to be the shooters. The shooting actually doesn't go well. And Tupac is expected to live. And what are you going to do now? Now you got to kill Tupac in the hospital. And, you know, IVs to the, you know, you, it's a direct portal into somebody's bloodstream. Easiest place to kill somebody is in the hospital. A few drops of poison and no more Tupac. 
And that's that's what happened to Tupac. And then the Biggie thing, Biggie was just to throw everybody off the trail to sell the East Coast, West Coast war. And that's what it was. And you had Rafael Perez, who was on duty at the time of Biggie's murder. He kicks the shell casings and disrupts the crime scene while he's in the LAPD uniform and he's punched in on the clock. You have David Mack, who's there. They're coordinating, you know. He's not a police officer, but he's in uniform? No, no, no. Both of them are police officers. Okay. And that's why the city of L.A. would be liable for this. And you have a gentleman, and I use the word loosely, who shows up in front of the Peterson Automotive Museum, opens up his car door right in front of the fire department. Uh, when his car door opens, his his gun drops out. He picks it up, stands on the sidewalk, shoots a few rounds into the air just to make sure his gun still works, and then gets in the car and drives on down the road. Well, what do you think the fire people do? They call you know, the police. They call it in. Now all of the cops that are in the vicinity are now going down Wilshire Boulevard to try and catch this guy because he's got a gun and he's fired it in the air. And right then, when everybody's chasing this guy down Wilshire, is when the Biggie murder happens. And, and they say it's not related. There's no relation here. This has absolutely nothing. To, one has nothing to do with the other. Yeah, it's called, in military t- tactics, that's called a feint. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, you've got all the good cops that are led astray, you know, trying to chase somebody down. And they, they catch him. And, you know, he gets charged with a gun possession or some, you know, and he's he's out, you know, no problem. We're going to slap him on the wrist because, you know, this couldn't possibly be related. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And, yeah, and you know what? And, and all this corruption, it, it all... It all, you know, it, it, it is all related. It does lead to higher places, things that what we should call is the higher order, because, you know, there are some names maybe we don't talk about or shouldn't talk about, you know, if we know what's good for us. So we just call it the higher order, and this all leads to the higher order. A lot of people made billions of dollars. A lot of people who we think made billions of dollars were just a front for you know, money that's going to be passed generationally to make sure there's pockets of money to do things that need to be done. You know, no bullet amendment's going to stop us. Yeah, cutouts. No bullet amendment's going to stop us. No legislation that says we can't do gain-of-function research. No, no anything. But the good news is that there are people like Colby and like McDuff that are actually trying to fight this stuff from the inside and I think there are more of us that are good people than there are people out there that are bad people. And I think if we all held hands and compared notes, we would find that this stuff would end. And that's probably what needs to happen. I think racking our slides might help, too. Yeah, well, you know what? If one thing for sure, when they do the Guns for Food program in America, you know... Don't get suckered into it because, you know, you, no Twinkie is worth it. No Twinkie is worth it. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm old enough now where I try and eat it for health. And, you know, I, I don't eat Twinkies anymore, but I sure did love them back in the day. But mm-hmm. I'd never trade a gun for. I Twinkie. think you had I think you had three Cobb salads in a row, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I just try and be healthy. You yeah. know, it's. You know, so so if anybody wonders out there, I you know my blood work is perfect. I'm in perfect health. You know, I'm I don't take light aircraft. I don't get into canoes. You know, I, I try and stay away from you know any of that kind of stuff. I don't go to police stations and you know try and get a murder investigation reopened. You know, try and stay away by from your, all that by, stuff. By yourself? Yeah, come alone. You know. Yeah. They really got mad when I said that the first time. We didn't tell him to come alone. I said, well, you told him not to bring me. That's telling him to come alone. Right. So funny. what's next for you, Michael, on this on this thread? Well, so I've been down in Compton. I've been working on a film about the birth of the Piru 
and Piru is really the first bloods. I've been working with a former mayor of Compton, Omar Bradley, and uh, we're looking to get that thing done in the next couple of months. And then I'm working on a film with George Webb, and I'm thrilled about that. I've already shot the key interviews for that. I spent four days with him in back in Maryland, and then we spent time down in uh, San Diego as well. And uh, a few days actually up here in Los Angeles, you know, kind of looking at the, the, the pipelines and the rat lines up here. And uh, I, I'm thrilled about all of it. You know, it's all exciting stuff. But as you guys both know, as you're both filmmakers, making a film is a little bit more tedious than doing a live stream. And, you know, you, you definitely have to captivate an audience a little bit more significantly than in a live stream. So it's a little bit more of a process. Yeah, well, if you can wrangle George, more power to you. Yeah, well, I, I got to tell you, George is just one of those amazing humans. And, uh, you know, we're all lucky to have him. Indeed. And, Indeed. You know, everybody that's, uh, that's following me should be followers of George because, you know, he's really the one that, uh, that kind of showed me how the school play thing worked, how to look for metadata, which I think is one of those keys for all of us is we got to be looking for the metadata. And, you know, we're going to be setting up some kind of a mechanism to fund George's film. We have yet to really set that up, but we're going to set it up. And anybody out there that wants to donate to it, more than happy to, you know, reach out to me. You can reach out to me on Twitter or you can reach out to me at my email, which is really simple. It's Michael Douglas Carlin at gmail.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Let's see if the, anybody has any questions for you in the last couple of minutes here. I'm definitely, I'm, I'm, I feel like I've gotten some resolution on all of this, Michael. I've been wondering about it since the fall of my senior year when yeah. we were East Coast kids, but we like the West Coast rap better. So it hit us really hard. Well, you know, all this stuff was an operation, you know, all that gangster rap. It was an operation and everybody loved it. It, it was effective. I don't think, I don't believe he sold 250 million records, though. No, not in his lifetime. I mean, he might have sold quite a bit since then. Sure. You no, know, I hear Tupac when I'm in China. I hear Tupac everywhere. I've been all over the world listening to Tupac. But you got to remember, Napster comes out not shortly thereafter. Yeah. So yeah. that definitely changed things. And then Apple, you know, Apple has changed music too. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's yeah, I'll bet Kamala really was torn up. Yeah. All right. Kamala's yeah, so never been to Europe. I mean, you know, a poor woman. Yeah, the poor thing. She spent summers in India, though. Yeah. Well. But for some reason, bypassed Europe on the way there. I've never really heard of a vice president that didn't, like, show up at the White House. I mean, she's been traveling a lot, hasn't she? <laughs> she seems so bothered. Yeah. by this job yeah whenever whenever i uh catch her for five seconds she just seems to be completely put out that she has to show up to do anything yeah well she's just waiting on the sidelines and you know the call will come soon enough yes <laughs> Nuremberg. No, I was thinking Gettysburg. I thought I was thinking, you know, a after World War II, that they had the Nuremberg trials. If this actually, if uh, there is any justice in the world, we should probably have Gettysburg trials. You know, that that's by you, Tracy, right? Yes, it is. Indeed. Um. So yeah. So uh, final thoughts. Um. So uh, I I I'm I'm mostly. Uh, aligned with you, Michael. I, I'm I'm not sure that there is a solution to this that's self-evident. Uh, you know, barring um, I I was thinking about uh, the original version of Sim City the other day, and uh, I don't know if anybody's ever, ever anybody's ever played it or remembers it, but w w as soon as you got your city kind of like operating nominally, so that you know you were collecting enough taxes and you had enough fire department and policemen and stuff, everything seemed to be working well. Then aliens would invade or a, a Godzilla monster would walk, would go, rampage through the, the town or uh, you'd get hit with a massive earthquake. Earthquakes were happening a lot. 
Um, it just seems like that without some kind of uh, divine intervention, that the, this st the trajectory that we are on isn't going to get better. I mean, wh what are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, I think we have to wake up every morning hopeful. And, you know, there hasn't been a lot to be hopeful about lately. You know, the news has all been bad. You know, coronavirus, lockdowns, people that we know that have businesses are out of business. Businesses we used to go to have been shuttered, you know, and you know, not, not a lot to be hopeful about. So I think we need to find those rays of hope where we can and look at the McDuffs and the Colbys and know that there are people that are working inside the system to try and help us solve this. And we have to, you know, they have to be encouraged to come forward and talk about it. And the more we share the peace that we know with each other, I think the, the stronger the solution is going to become for us. All righty. Uh, with that, uh, I guess we'll say goodbye. Goodbye, Tracy. All right. Bye. All right, thank, thank you, you Michael. Everybody, like and subscribe, and yada yada yada. We're 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 still like under eight hundred followers on YouTube. If we get to that magic thousand, I think we can do super super hearts or something like that. Chat. Um, super chats. Um, so uh, yeah, so tell your friends and neighbors and your family, and we'll and I'm, see. I'm happy to repost this on my channel too. I've got oh, a. Yeah. I've got like 10,000 subscribers on my channel and maybe some of my subs will become yours. Well, oh yeah, we should yeah, we should tell people where they can where they can find you. You've got a oh, that that was the uh tupacmurdersolved.com takes you right to my channel. Oh, perfect. All right, oh. Tupac Murder Solved. I'll add that to the notes on here. And then do you have a Patreon anything like that? I don't really have any of that stuff set up. I okay. mean, Michael Douglas Carlin at gmail.com is my PayPal. If somebody wants to PayPal, and I'll put that right into the film fund for the George Webb untitled film. All right. Awesome. And Michael, you and I have to get together because you look much better now than your picture. <laughs> okay. And I want to make you look good, man. Well, let's do it. it sounds all, good. All right. Indeed. All right. Well, all right. Th thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Take care. Oh, yeah.